How's it looking? Is everybody seeing my PowerPoint? Yes. Absolutely yes. wonderful. Huzzah. Well, welcome everybody to the Wiki Watchy Room. I hope you're all having a wonderful vintage Florida morning. As you can see, I found my cat glasses from back in the day. I have a funny story. I am from Minnesota, but my grandparents were motorcycle bikers in Minnesota and they one time rode their motorcycles to Florida and I remember my grandma wearing a white leather motorcycle outfit and she said she wore it to about South Carolina and then she never wore it again because it was too hot but she had saved up all this money for her leather jacket to wear to Florida not realizing it's not Minnesota weather but I give an ode to my grandma because I remember she had on these awesome glasses <laughs> So welcome everybody to the Top Kit Workshop 2023. I see so many of my Florida friends here. Hold on, I'm still scrolling. Oh my goodness, so many people. Wow. So how's everybody doing? Do we have the same Florida allergies now that we had back in the 60s and 70s? Is your car sprinkled with yellow fairy dust this morning? <laughs> I think we should, instead of Florida pollen, I think we should call it Florida fairy dust. That just makes it sound a little bit happier and better. <laughs> ooh, ooh, I see. It looks like we have a few snowbirds out there as well. Welcome our snowbirds. And yes, I want to thank, we have some awesome, lovely visitors today. We have somebody from John Hopkins visiting us, somebody from Purdue University visiting us, and from the University of Texas. So I will turn down my air conditioning to make sure you guys can hear me up there as we're talking. <laughs> this is going to be a great day in Florida, and I'm so glad that all of you are here with me. Um, I just wanted to make a little note up in my name. I changed it to my name, and then I put my um, um, institution in abbreviations. And that was a recommendation we got last year. A lot of people remembered first name and the university they were at, but not necessarily last name. So I figure if I can be like, Wendy, UCF, and just kind of get that down. So if you don't mind or you want to, please put your name and then your institution and change that. And that helps with our contacts and our communities over the next few days. Oh. Okay. So I am going to make, oh, am I still sharing? Wonderful. Okay, I'm gonna make a general exciting announcement that happened in July. Um, some of you may be seeing me as a new face and wondering what happened to Amanda Major. Uh, Amanda Major has been lovely and wonderful and the Top Kit project manager for several years. And this year she transitioned out of the role and I was lucky enough to step into her shoes. So I am the new Top Kit project manager. So if you haven't been introduced to me, I am so happy to be in this role and happy to be here. And I look forward to working with you in the next few days at the workshop. If there's anything I can do for you, um, please let me know. I would love for you to reach out to me. I love everything Top Kit. Um, believe it or not, I actually helped write the proposal eight years ago. Um, and I was one of the planners and the facilitators at the first Top Kit workshop back in 2017. So it's really nice to be back and to be part of the workshop and to get to speak with all of you. So a great big welcome for me. Um, I'm gonna have a couple of people also here, as you can see on the screen, who are able to step in this morning and give us a welcome. So I will start and turn it over to Charlene Hugh. And Subi, it's still showing the first welcome slide right now. Oh there no. Perfect. You got it now. Okay. Oh. Hello. There we go. Can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. I'm also having the Florida allergy at the moment. So my voice <laughs> is a bit off, but I want to say welcome to everyone. Welcome to the Top Key Workshop 2023. I'm Shaolin Hu, Director of Instructional Design at the Division of Digital Learning at UCF. I am so honored to be the chair of this year's workshop. And Top Kit Workshop first started in 2027, 20, 2017, I'm sorry, 2017. So this is the seventh year. Whether you've been here before or this is your first time, this is my first time, by the way. I'm so pleased to have each of you here today as we explore the best practices of online teaching together. And my colleagues, 
Sue, Bauer, Charlotte, Jones, Roberts, and the rest of the planning committee have put together an incredible lineup of sessions for us all to enjoy. So I know they have worked very hard to make this event enjoyable and full of learning opportunities. So please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or comments. I want everyone to have a great time networking and learning new things. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. I appreciate a few moments of your time. And it was very exciting. Charlene's new in her role with us at the ID team here at UCF. And we thought this would be a great opportunity for her to get in and see all the ins and out of the program while in a fun position to kind of host us. So thank you so much for taking on that role and welcoming everybody to the workshop. I also have with us Top Kit Principal Investigator, Tom Cavanaugh, who is also the Vice Provost here for the Digital Learning Center at the University of Central Florida. So Welcome, Tom, and I appreciate you taking a few minutes. Thanks, Sue. Um, really, really glad uh, to be here. Uh, you know, TopKit has evolved over the years, and uh, I'm just sort of uh, thrilled that um, that that we're able to con continue to offer this, um, and that that it's become a real community around the state and and even in even beyond. So I just I just had a couple of uh, opening thoughts. The first is that um, I want to commend everybody who's participating. That you you took time out of your schedules to get this kind of professional development. I think it shows a real commitment to the profession and to your own professionalism, and and to the to the faculty that we all support um, the teaching faculty on our on our campuses. So you know kudos to you for being part of the top kid community and, and putting in the investment to, to, to be a participant. And as I think about the kind of post COVID experience that we're all in right now, um, institutions that maybe prior to the pandemic didn't really have, I would say a, a strategic intentional plan for online learning are now confronted with the fact that they're gonna need a strategic intentional plan for online learning. And even those of us, I think Florida is probably ahead of some other states, but even those of us that, that were involved with online learning prior to COVID um, have recognized that it, that it was an inflection point and that kind of how we think about online learning in a post-COVID world is a little bit different from what it was before, whether it's in practice, such as synchronous instruction that seems to be a lot more ubiquitous now than it was before the pandemic, or more um, more fundamental things like student expectations. Students coming out of high school who, who dealt with remote learning in high school now having some expectations for being able to go to school online in, in college and university, and frankly, having some higher expectations than the experience they had in high school, um, and maybe justifiably so. And I think we are kind of grappling with this new landscape. So how can we as a community really help the faculty that we're charged with supporting to help navigate that new landscape. And I, and I think that's that's part of the challenge before us. Um, I've, I've said this many times that, um, that it's easy to, to scale online learning, but it's hard to do it with quality. You know, you can create a, a new shell of the LMS and say, go teach. That's easy. Um, the hard part, though, is all the infrastructure of creating quality, of instructional design, of developing media, of doing student support and faculty support, all of that, that I call it the quality supply lines. And it's real easy to outrun your quality supply lines if you're not careful. And, and you all are ensuring that the quality supply lines are good and that we're not outrunning them. We're not just opening up new you know, Canvas sections and saying, go teach, because that doesn't do anybody any good and it's not a service to our students or our faculty. So I'll just kind of leave you with this that um, uh, please take take advantage of this opportunity to be together in community even if it's virtual. Um, there's a lot to learn but you know I think maybe the best learnings that we get are from each other so you know please please take advantage of that and then and maybe the very last thing I'll say is just a big thank you to the to the team that worked on putting this together. Um, here at UCF, I know that <laughs> I see the work because there's a million meetings uh, that go on behind the scenes. So, you know, thanks to Sue and the whole team 
um, Charlene, everybody who put everything together um, behind the scenes to make sure that this is a success, but also to everybody from other institutions, you know, the advisory board and others who've been a part Absolutely. of this. It couldn't happen um, without, I think, a real collective effort, and 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 I and I think you'll see that um, when uh, when we're all done here. So thank you, Sue. Thank you, Charlene. I appreciate the opportunity to come and say hi. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to uh, add on to what Tom had said. He said that a lot of us are looking at program planning for uh, online dis uh, distance initiatives and wonderfully part of the topkit.org wor workshop under planning has some wonderful planning checklists if you are developing a program, a course, or even a degree. So if you are somebody that's doing that and needs some resources, please go visit that area. If you're somebody that's already done it and when you visit our resources, you think I've got some good stuff to contribute please read out, reach out to us. We are always adding resources and content and connections um, to the different areas of TopKip. So please take a visit to that. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to benchmark again on what Tom said. Hopefully you are seeing my screen. Is that correct? Wonderful. All right. So just like Tom, this is not a one one person show. I we have a wonderful committee. I am the project manager for all of TopKit. So I was a sidekick to Charlotte. Charlotte has been the lead for this workshop and done amazing, uh, keeping everything going and working. I tell her it's gears that just kind of all have to work together. And if one jams, you fix it and it's all going to go together. But kudos to Charlotte. She's leading this workshop. She's also our outreach coordinator. Bren, we couldn't do it without Bren. She did all these, well, she worked with our graphics department to request and get all these amazing graphics for our vintage top kit this year. She also helps with our communication and the top kit digest. Uh, we also have Tina Calandrino visiting us today. Uh, she has been a wonderful part of the workshop for a few years. She's great at bringing in the themes. Uh, so those letters that you have gotten with the, the vintage Florida theme, she's been fantastic at writing those up. She's also helped with Susie working with the presenters. Uh, Susie's new to the Top Kit workshop, and hopefully we haven't scared her off, and she'll be back again next year. But again, she does workshop communications. She's been helping getting all the good stuff into WebEx um, and all things social media. So she's helped with the Twitter and all those that have been going out there. And we also have Rebecca, who's also new to the workshop committee, and she's been wonderful with the program, the schedule, and also helping in WebEx. And then not but not last but not least, we have Joe, and Joe again has been an amazing part. He has worked with the Top Kit web, uh, Workshop web page, so making sure that that's updated and providing you all the good info before the web uh, workshop started. He was one that facilitated receiving and sorting the proposals for the peer review, um, sending out the acceptance note, and then he was the one that was able to figure out through the tallies and the voting from the peer reviews our best in track. So again. Thank you to all those that you see on the screen now. Without them, we could not do Top Kit Workshop. So I just wanted to give a few minutes for that. Um, but then I'm going to turn it over now to Charlotte, and she's going to go over just a few logistics with you, um, and then we will get started. So thank you, everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sue. And again, Top Kit truly is a team effort. So thank you to everybody who is involved in Top Kit. It really does take a village a community to keep everything going. So thank you so much. Um, what I wanted to go through for um, is just a little bit of housekeeping and does the slide going forward, Sue? Awesome. So I just wanted to make a really quick note about competing in the shuffleboard contest. Some of you have already participated inside of the shuffleboard contest. It is a game that you can use codes to then gain points for your codes and then um, continue in be on the leaderboard. So if you enter into, into Socio Ready Day one into the shuffleboard contest, you will automatically get points for entering those codes. And so you can see your name rise to the top of the leaderboard. Additionally, and perhaps most importantly, each session will earn you a code at the very end of the session. Your moderator will share it in the chat at the end of your session. So you can only attend one session each hour, of course, but if you attend the most sessions, you will get points added to each session that you attend. 
As you go through Socio, you'll also notice there's a water cooler, which is a place where we can just kind of hang out in between the sessions. You can send messages to people who you connect with. You can post on the connections wall also for some stuff on the shuffleboard contest. You can grab codes um, and download vintage postcards for Zoom. So I hope that you get a background like this and add it to the whole journey as you go through your top kit workshop experience. And we have one more thing to add. And that is please, if you haven't done so already, go into the connections wall and introduce yourself. I know many of you have already taken part in this, but we also very much encourage you to update your profile, add a little bio about yourself and connect with others as you're inside of this connections wall. There's going to be a reflection activity at the end of the day where you will also be sharing what your favorite part of the Top Kit Workshop for that day is. So this is where everybody's going to meet asynchronously. So I hope you check that out. And that is it. That's all I had. So I'm going to take it back to Subi to introduce our keynote. Thanks so much, Charlotte. Um, I am going to go ahead and just introduce the wonderful Dr. Wendy Howard. Wendy Howard is one of our uh, key facilitators with I with I'm sorry with Top Kit, um, but she's also going to be our keynote panel facilitator today. Um, so I will turn it over to her. She is wonderful, and she's going to introduce our panel and facilitate some fantastic questions that they've been working on. So I will turn it over to Wendy Howard. She is the Pegasus director at the Innovation Lab here at the University of Central Florida. And like I said, also one of the Top Kit Advisory Board members. So Wendy, thank you so much for being here today. And I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Sue. I really appreciate that. And it is such an honor to be moderating this distinguished panel. Um, it's also great to see so many familiar faces. Like Charlene said, this is our seventh year and some of you have not missed a beat. So um, some of you have been here every year and you may even recall that first year, Sue and I co-facilitated face-to-face -face here in Orlando and we all got top kit um, tattoos. <laughs> so um, we have some great memories we can go back and share later. But I also wanna welcome those of you who are new, especially those joining us from outside of Florida. Um, I would like to take a moment to um, introduce each of our distinguished panelists. And Sue, I think you're the host of the meeting. So if you wouldn't mind, would you please pin each of our panelists as I introduce them? Um, starting with Vicki Westergaard. Vicki joins us from St. Petersburg College, where she's the Executive Director of Instructional Design, Education, and Support. Uh, so if you could pin Vicki, either you, Sue, or Charlotte hopefully can. Um, then next we have Christine Brown, who joins us from the University of South Florida. She's the Associate Vice President of Innovative Education. And then also our third panelist is Josh Stragel, joining us from the College of Central Florida. He's the Director of eLearning and Learning Support Centers. And our goal today uh, as a panel is to reflect on the past, examine where we are, and share insight into what the panelists feel will be the future of teaching and learning online in the state of Florida. Uh, so we do like to say with Top Kit, while we're Florida focused, we're not Florida exclusive. So a lot of this conversation uh, will be centered around what's going on in the state of Florida, but it certainly applies elsewhere outside of the state as well. So we'll be looking at some general trends, um, but we try to also keep it um, with keep Florida in mind with this audience. So as a as an icebreaker to get the conversation rolling, um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists about their earliest memory of online teaching and learning. Um, as you're thinking about your responses, I'm going to date myself. It was somewhere around 1998, 1990, uh, when I was volunteering in the computer lab in my junior high school, and we connected to the internet for the first time. That horrible noise that went crazy, and we went into Prodigy, and my my lab. Um, instructor said, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to use this for teaching? I can look up stocks and the weather. <laughs> and my, have we come a long way since then? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so why don't I um, open it up with Vicki? Why don't you share your earliest memory and we will get you pinned up here. I think I oh. have her pinned. Oh, I only see me. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well. Maybe if we stop, stop sharing your screen, Sue. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, go ahead, Vicki. That's okay. Thank you, Wendy. It's good to see you online again. 
Um, it's interesting. You mentioned 1998 because I was going to say like 1998, uh, I was here at St. Petersburg College and you were in junior high. So uh, I was working here even, not just a student or a student assistant, but we were on WebCT at that point. And it was kind of new for everybody and uh, a good progression though from telecourses. So that was, uh, that was major technology. And faculty had to ask to get a shell to offer a class in. We didn't give shells to anyone unless they requested them. Uh, so it's, it's quite a difference from the place that we are today where everyone gets a shell regardless of modality, and uh, of course, we've been through two other LMSs since then. So Angel and, and now we're on D2L. So quite a progression. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Vicki. Um, I'm gonna bring up Christine next. Christine, would you like to share your earliest memory? Yeah, so I'm gonna date myself too, because Wendy, thanks for making, feel, me, make, making me feel old there. Um, so I'm gonna go pre-online courses. So when I was um, finishing up my bachelor's degree that took me way too long to get, uh, I had one <laughs> course left to take and that was German. Um, and my institution didn't offer German three. So I had to do a correspondence course at University of Florida to finish that out. And it, it was rough, but it was actually organized very well, right? You would get your assignments through the mail, you would do them, and then you would return them through the mail. And I remember thinking, thinking to myself, like, there's got to be a better way. And now look at us. Thanks, Christine. Um, I'm going to bring up Josh and ask you to share yours too, Josh. All right. Well, I had my... Um prop here i don't know if you can i can't see myself on here i don't know if you can see it but um vicky mentioned web ct so that's where we started as well um my earliest memory actually kind of predates that a little bit because we're we're in the late 90s the summer of 97 i was sitting in community college orientation and as the um, advisor um, guidance counselor at the time was giving the orientation and talking about these new online courses i thought now who in the world would want to go to college online and about six months later i was employee one at the help desk at the college supporting both webcp and blackboard at the time the state of florida had contract with both of them similar to what we have with canvas now and it was five hundred dollars per system per institution so we were running both of those systems simultaneously um, we still use the postal service still use vhs tape and it was kind of off to the races from there Wow, <laughs> these are great stories. I'm sure everyone in, in the audience has a story they can share too. I mean, feel free to to put little um, you know summaries in the chat. I, you don't have to tell a whole long story, but I'm sure everyone has stories they want to share too. Uh, but I'm going to keep the conversation rolling. And like I said, we're going to start by looking at the past. And I have two question prompts uh, for the panel, um, kind of under the the heading of sometimes everything old is new again. Um, and one area is cheating. Cheating still a thing. It was in the past. It probably will be in the future, um, but it's still a thing. And so I'm going to ask our panelists, maybe starting with Vicki, as you prepare faculty and support their online teaching, what is still the same and what new challenges are you now forced to tackle in regards to online teaching or sorry, well, online cheating? <laughs> on Online cheating cheating in in general is forever right i mean there's been cheating since people were writing the answers to their quizzes on their uh sole of their converse sneakers or on the label of their water bottle that they you know peeled off and wrote it on the inside um and i think the challenge is it's always something that faculty are concerned about rightly so and worried about the newest thing and so, you know, that progression of cheating, regardless of modality, I mean, there was cheating when, when I was in college back in the, in the stone tablet days. So, you know, er, people are gonna cheat, 
But now we've progressed to a place where um, at a recent meeting we were talking about, is it a crisis or is it an opportunity to look at some of these new tools? And we'll talk about those a little later, including the C word, chat GPT. We will be talking about that. But those kinds of things, I think, are always coming at us. So we're always having to kind of shift our strategies and talk about ways that you could maybe use some of these tools for, for good and not evil and help your students learn how to navigate them as well. Yeah, and I'm going to invite Josh and Christine to jump in if you want to add to what Vicki said or um, comment. I'll just add that. You know, as instructional designers, a lot of you, you're really in a great place to address this because we really are at a point, a tipping point, where it may be time to leave some of the old methods, you know, some of them maybe like uh, multiple choice test banks maybe should have been left behind a long time ago. But now moving forward, I think, that time is um, very much here and you're in a great place to help faculty um, forge a new path. Yeah, you know, I, I definitely want to second that. And I think, you know, everything that we do as designers is around, you know, authentic learning experiences. And I think we all have to, you know, figure out new tactics to reach faculty, to have them rethink how they're assessing learning outcomes, right? You know, whether it's proctoring solutions or, you know, worried about students, you know, getting a hold of that the, the chat GPT there. I said it, Vicki, I said it. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's really like, how do people learn? And how are we assessing that people are learning? And, and you're right, Josh, that's not about, you know, multiple choice questions and high stakes testing. It's about like authentic learning experiences. Yeah, and I, I'm going to keep things moving, but those are all great comments. Um, under the, the label of sometimes everything old is new again, the other topic that we um, had talked about in our planning was information fluency. That's something that's been around for quite some time. Um, but I'm going to, starting with Christine, ask you to comment, um, how has the scope of faculty inf information fluency needs changed over the years? Uh, it certainly has changed, and I don't want all three to feel, of you to feel like you have to comment on every question, but I'll put it to Christine first, and then uh, if Vicki and Josh want to add or comment um, afterwards, feel free to just unmute. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you know, for faculty, information fluency is the foundation for effective teaching, research, and scholarship, right? But to be truly information fluent, people, including faculty, have to be both information literate and digitally fluent. So we're now at a time where the expectation for faculty is not just to be digitally literate, right? We hear all of you know, the, the vernacular around digital literacy, but I think that has gone from the wayside, right? Now it's digitally fluent and faculty have to merge those two things. In the past, faculty information needs were really focused around finding and using information from traditional sources, right? Like books and journals and library collections in their teaching and research practice. But with new technologies, the scope of faculty information fluency needs has expanded dramatically. So they've got to be proficient in a wide range of tools like learning management systems, right? We're probably everybody in the state of Florida now is, is basically Canvas users. That, that's a huge one. Um, they also have to be fluent in multimedia content development tools. Um, you know, we're getting into mixed realities and AI. I think AI is going to come up many times uh, during Top Kit during these next several days. Um, but also around citation management, online databases, OER, and not to mention not just teaching and learning tools, but, um, you know, regulations and legal issues around data sharing and privacy. So, but all of this comes down to, you know, the, the needs of the students. Tom in the intro mentioned about, you know, Gen Z students entering college right now. They survived, survived the shift um, to online during the pandemic, which was kind of both good and bad. Um, and now they've grown up in a world where digital technologies are completely ubiquitous um, and have become a part of their normal life. 
So I think faculty in support of those students and us as practitioners supporting those students have to kind of step up our game and, and make sure that we're there to meet their needs. I think I would add um, to all the great stuff that Christine said, just helping our faculty be comfortable themselves being kind of lifelong learners in that digital fluency because it's always a new tool. It's not just you get training on the LMS and everything is great from there on out. There are so many plugins and add-ons and things like Flipgrid and other you know, pieces and parts that can help with engagement in their classes. And so having them feel not feel like they used to, whereas when are you gonna offer me a training on this thing? Um, they need to be able to be comfortable enough to, you know, maybe we hold their hand a little bit while they get started into testing some things and trying some things out and being okay with, you're not going to break it uh, mentality, but just really helping them um, feel free to try things out. Yeah, and I think you both bring up so many excellent points. And as faculty developers, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the folks in our audience, um, it, it used to be one and done in the old days, right? Like here's here's how to get into the LMS, here's how to put your content out there. And now, you know, some of our, our faculty members maybe haven't engaged with our faculty development programming in years and they're falling behind. So how can you keep them coming back to keep them on top of these trends like you're both saying? Um, I think it's one of the biggest challenges for our audience right now is how do you keep them coming back so that you can keep them current? And, and I think, and get excited about it, right? So, you know, uh, uh, my team at USF, like we're really focused on on driving that motivation, right? Not taking that out of faculty going, oh, just one more thing I've got to learn or one more thing I have to do on top of everything else. But like to make them excited about learning these new things and make them excited because their students are excited to participate and engage in these new technologies. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to keep things rolling then. One more question as we look back to the past before we start to look at now and future thinking. Um, so reflecting on the past, some technologies were a little threatening to faculty members when first introduced. Think back to when MOOCs first came onto the scene or even videos or podcasts. Um, how have we now collectively embraced successful and non-threatening uses of some of those older technologies that were so scary at first? Um, and I guess I'll put it to Josh first, um, since we haven't heard from you in a bit, but I certainly invite Vicki and Christine to chime in. Um, so MOOC, I'm starting to see a little shift in that arena from massively open online courses to maybe moderately open online courses. Um, some, especially some of the larger universities are refocusing those to target specific groups maybe allow um, some underperforming students an opportunity to demonstrate proficiency and move back towards um, good academic standing or something like that. So I think it's moving away from the threat of just, okay, we're going to throw our degree out there and let students move through it in an you know, unmoderated format to Let's leverage these tools and what we've learned and often, frankly, failed experiments with MOOCs to um, give specific populations an opportunity to thrive again. Yeah, I'll jump in too. So um, I, I got to say, I love the MOOC. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> and, and I think too, you know, edX launched that platform in 2012. And I mean, I, I, I would argue that it was wildly successful, not to mention a couple of years ago, they just sold it to 2U for $800 million. I mean, crazy. Um, but I think to me, when I look at a MOOC, I think like, you know, I've got that affirm affirmation that like lifelong learning is really a thing, right? Like I don't look at it and, and and maybe I'm different, but I don't look at it as a challenge to higher education, right? We're all still here 10 years away. But what I do look at it as, you know, satisfying that that intellectual curiosity about something on one end of the spectrum of lifelong learning. And the other one is, you know, using it to upskill and reskill. 
and and using our faculty, like in, in the case of like edX and and all of the other ones that came about it, you know, those were actually university faculty developing and teaching those MOOC courses. So using and rethinking about faculty expertise in a different way to me is super exciting. Um, we're actually launching a chat GPT AI MOOC in a couple of days, a free MOOC. I'll, I'll paste the URL in the in the chat here if you like. Um, <laughs> but we're actually thinking about using it in a couple of different ways. One is, you know, just a, a it's like seminar style to kind of demystify this whole chat GPT and, you know, think about how you can use AI in your everyday life. But the other part of it, again, is we're featuring USF experts around AI. And, and there's the kick, right? There's that tie into the university experience. And that what we're doing is all, the, you know, we're hoping we get thousands of people because it's free, but we can also highlight our fully online graduate level programs that are designed around AI and tie in the university experience and the credentials of the university with our faculty experts. So I think it's just kind of like, rethinking how to use the MOOC and use it to its benefits. And Vigya, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that or maybe some other technologies besides MOOCs that, um, you know, maybe were a threat when it first entered the scene and now we've figured out how to better embrace them. Well, so many things. I mean, you know, people are putting things in the chat about, you know, calculators and spell check and all sorts of things that have, I, I'm sure we use these things all ourselves now. Um, you know, you're not going to be doing this stuff uh, from scratch if you don't have to. Um, for us, as, as far as going back to MOOCs, for us, you know, our faculty were worried, oh, our jobs are over if we start doing MOOCs because who, what student is going to pay? And, you know, all these different platforms, Coursera and everybody else, have figured out, okay, you can take the class for free, but getting the credential, maybe you paid to get that, that part. And what we did early on was we determined that we would just use MOOCs as our, um, our high school outreach for developmental education. And so we had a math MOOC and a reading MOOC and a writing MOOC so that we could just send that out. And we had thousands of people take advantage of that and they still do. So, you know, it's just finding ways to work with things and help uh, faculty, I think, be comfortable with these new things and realize that, you no, know, it, it may change the way you do your job, but it's not going to end your job. You're still going to be employed. Yeah, well said. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you wanted to talk about any other technologies before we move on. I, we, we jumped on the MOOC thing, which I think was a really good conversation and a good model for other technologies. But are there are others you want to address before we move on? Yeah, I want to jump on podcasts. Yeah. So podcasts have, you know, like rebranded themselves. I, I don't know what happened, but like, you know, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more, we saw this like podcasting trend. And then I feel like it kind of dissipated a little bit, but now it's back, baby. And I think like, I just saw a recent statistic and let me pull it up. 34% of the world's population accesses a podcast at least once a month. Like, think about your audience there, right? And, and you know, the, the, the beauty of a podcast is you can self-serve a podcast. You can find whatever you want, whatever floats your boat, whenever you want, and listen to it. And when we think about how that translates to teaching and learning, you know, there's a lot of crossover there. So I really focus on, you know, the, the audience, the student, right? So when we're designing fully online graduate level programs, that student is very unique, right? They're typically students who are a little bit older, have families, going back to school. And honestly, they're like me. You know, I'm circling, finishing my dissertation for way too many years now. So, you know, this is my own life experience as a single parent. Every minute of my day is consumed by something. So if I can, when I'm dropping my kid off in the morning or driving to work or driving to the grocery store, listen to a little bit of a lecture from my class that's actually done in an engaging way, then that's like one less thing I have to do when I get home. So I think, you know, really using this technologies to our benefit and meeting the needs of students where they are is totally what, what we're focused on. I really, I got into podcasting for a lot of entertainment kind of things, you know, listening to various um, 
presentations, whether it was things that I heard on the radio that I missed part of, and I so I'd look at the end of Fresh Air or Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me or something like that. But you know, they're so prevalent now for everything. Sometimes I feel like I do need to see visuals of things, but certainly you can get a lot of good discussion in. And I noticed that Tom Cavanaugh, I can't, my, um, my top cast sticker is out of uh, bounds of where I can reach right now, but uh, the top cast podcast is a great way to learn things about online teaching and learning. So i um, glad it's still going on. Yes, it, it actually makes me mad. I didn't think of that myself first. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for the promotion. I did put it in the chat. There's a direct link to the top cast in there now. Um, but I'm going to move things on to the present, right? So what are the newest challenges that you are currently trying to help faculty address today? I don't know who wants to go first. About well, Josh, we haven't heard from you. Oh, go ahead. No, go for it, Josh. <laughs> All right. Well, my area that you know, I end up you know, looking at a lot is institutional support and as we move past the pandemic i think you know, your institutions are facing a lot of challenges because there were there was special funding there was an urgent need for many of the supports we put in place and now institutions are looking at those supports and saying well you know the dollars have been you know been reduced there's no more special funding. Which of those supports do we need and which, you know, maybe can we leave uh, by the side? So as instructional designers, you're that human support. And I think you're going to see yourself potentially in more demand, even than you were during the pandemic because uh, because of the new phase that we're in of finding out how to keep things going. Most of us have more online learners than we did before the pandemic, even though things are back to normal. And, you know, you're just really going to have to shoulder a lot of that support burden, I think. Yeah, and I know Vicky, you were gonna respond, so I'll give you the floor. <laughs> That's okay. I can. I, I just have so many things going in my head right now. So one thing that we used to do in person before the pandemic, uh, a, a while ago, we would do faculty sharing sessions, and we had those had kind of trailed off. In, in person was less popular, but during the pandemic, when we had hundreds of faculty who had never taught online and they needed to get up to speed with that. We started doing some Zoom um, sessions where people would get on and say, well, I was trying this in my class and here's how I handle that. And they were really sharing things with each other that were very helpful. And it was very engaging for them to hear from their peers and not just an instructional designer of here's a, here's a strategy and here's how I'm implementing it in my class. So um, we're continuing that now. We're doing webinars and, and other things where we really encourage faculty to get involved and participate and not just listen passively. And those have, um, those have gone over very well for our faculty. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure, Christine, you're jumping at the bit to talk about chat GPT. <laughs> so why don't you jump in there? That might spark some more follow-up. <laughs> um, well, actually, what I was going to say, too, and, and I can totally talk about ChatGPT, um, but I, I think, too, you know, we have the fortune at USF of being um, partners in, in digital content creation whenever possible. Like, we're a heavy production team, um, and when we approach a new online course, we approach it from the perspective of, like, how do we make this better than an in-person class, right? How do we use technology and engagement strategies to actually, like, push the boundaries a little bit more. So we approach that and, and always like pulling in new technology as needed. So I think as we're working with faculty, trying to like 
either educate or catch up with them because they're way ahead of us or, you know, we're pulling them forward um, it is really thinking through that, right? So instead of trying to like replicate, you know, convert a face-to-face -face course to online, how do we actually like use new engagement tools to make it even better? What can you do online that you can't do in person? And how do you use technology to do that? And I have a whole list, but I'll shut up. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Well, and this is a good transition really to what's what's currently, you know, on your plate that you're trying to support faculty with, but also looking ahead, what are the newest challenges? Um, or sorry, what's on your radar? What's what's coming down the pike that you see? And this may also bring chat GPT into the conversation, but what are your insights into the future of teaching and learning and and faculty support needs, faculty development needs? I'll go. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so again, I'm going to speak from the from the the content side and what that all takes. So, um, you know, mixed realities, metaverse kind of thing is is huge now and and on the mind of faculty. Um, but it's difficult, right? It's one of those things that faculty want to use because, you know, it's an engaging tool. You know, you put goggles on and experience this completely immersive environment and it's awesome. But you have to think about access with that. You know, how many students do we, online students do we have that can afford, you know, an Oculus or a MetaQuest rather, MetaQuest now. Um, so thinking through those things, you know, is there kind of a lo-fi option, you know, where you could still have a, a VR experience with a phone instead. So kind of gauging those those levels based on access. Um, you know, we're also looking at, um, you know, immersive virtual content. So we're building a studio out that uh, allows faculty to actually like step into, you know, the uh, uh, an immersive environment and teach a class from that environment. So thinking about like, if you're talking about the human brain, right? We can 3D model the human brain and actually put a faculty member inside the brain as they're talking through all of these things and then bring that to students, right? Instead of it being a passive experience, you kind of bring them in with other engagement strategies. So thinking through like, how do we do that? That's nothing you can do on a broad scale, right? We only have so many 3D modelers can, that can work on that. So looking at being very strategic about how you're implementing these new technologies and the new content development tools and how you can scale those things. So we're still experimenting with that. Um, but the chat GPT side of it, I'll just say simply, you know, to us, it's about like demystifying chat GPT. So many faculty are very worried about what does that mean for cheating? And the bottom line is there's no getting around it. You know, the paradox of trying to say that AI is going to, you know, somebody is going to develop an AI tool that's going to detect cheating or detect copy that's been written by an AI is a paradox, right? AI learns. It's just going to learn how to detect cheating better and then overcome that problem, right? So it's it's never going to get there. But I, I would say with chat GPT and other generative AI tools, it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning. You know, that that really has to be about like really assessing true learning. If you're just saying, you know, how I'm going to assess you as you write this paragraph about whatever, that's not the assessment. Like we all know Bloom's taxonomy and, and regurgitating information is not, you know, a, a true uh, measure or, or, you know, show that you really can apply this learning to something else. So we have to get creative about how we're developing activities and assessing students. So I would say also um, adding on to the AI and the and the Oculus and all that, you have to help your faculty keep in mind the fact of you need to look, look at the pedagogy first and figure out, does this fun tool that everybody wants to have a reason to buy an Oculus or some other thing, is that actually going to carry forward the learning? Is there a pedagogical way to do it? Or are you doing it just to be fun and just to try to attract students because they get to do this in this class? And, and you know, you've got to think about the reality of the tech support for all that too, because it's not always just you plug it in and it works great every time. Um, and so you have to be prepared for that. I would say the other piece is um, 
we talked about a little bit about scalability. And as we encourage faculty to try out some new things, sometimes they do find out that it's not scalable, maybe even to their own class. They get into something that's got a limit of 25 for the free version, and they don't want to pay for the other version, but we don't have a college-wide license for it or a fund to be able to provide it for everybody that thinks of that. So that's a consideration as well as accessibility. And, you know, there are a lot of great tools that are very visual now, and we have to keep in mind that our students may not all be able to take advantage of those. So if they can't, what options are we going to give them to also meet those same learning objectives in a, in a, a, a par parallel way to their maybe hearing or um, uh, uh, people with ability to see. So there's, there's a lot to consider. And I think also um, we, our faculty are pulled in a lot of directions right now. And we have a lot of things going on, of course, in the state as well. But just at our institutions, I think we have a lot of, a lot of uh, initiatives aimed at increasing student success and, and engagement and re just really making courses richer. And at the same time, I feel like faculty uh, are trying to just keep their heads above water sometimes. And maybe they don't have time to come to a, a training, but they also don't have time to watch it later when it's on Zoom and has been recorded. So just that, just that balancing out, you know, what's going to be worth their time to come into a PD or work with us on a project. Thank you. And I, God, this is such a great conversation that I hate to cut short, but I'm watching the clock. And in all fairness, Josh, I'm going to give you an opportunity for a 30 seconds final word. Okay, just, um, just to feel like a downer, but remember where instructional design sits at the institution. Um, you're kind of between administration and faculty, so you have a great opportunity to help faculty and move things along, but you're also connected to administration, which has other concerns such as student data privacy. What does chat GPT mean for that? But also, try in 15 seconds, we had our time to shine, it's distance learning as a, whole, as a whole in the pandemic, we had our time to shine, but the spotlight has not turned off of us. So what I see coming in the future um, the public as a whole, regulators, everybody is looking at distance learning. So understand that your institutions are going to be reacting to a lot of public policy, public comment in the coming year or two regarding distance learning. I, I think that's a great place to, to wrap up our conversation, a really good point. I think a, a trend of our conversation today is you know, sometimes everything old is new again. And also the opportunities, uh, like you point out, Josh, the spotlight is on us. The opportunities are there um, to, you know, further push our field forward um, now that the spotlight is on us. So thank you all three for a wonderful conversation. This was very thought provoking. Um, I apologize to the audience that we didn't get enough time to open it up to Q&A, um, but I'm sure you will see all of us around at the, the Top Kid events throughout the next two days. Um, so feel free to, you know, pop into a chat or, or contact one of us outside of Top Kid um, with any questions you may have. And sorry for running a couple of minutes over, Sue. I'm, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you again, Wendy, for facilitating. Thank you, Christine, Josh, and Vicki for being here today. Like you said, wonderful conversation. I wanted to hear more, and I just kept shaking yes to everything you were saying. So fantastic. Really appreciate your time. We are going into a break, so we do have a couple minutes to kind of go get our drinks of water, refill our coffee, and do what we need to do. But at 2 o'clock, we will begin our first uh, round of sessions. So there will be three sessions. One will be taking place here in the Wiki Watchy room, um, but there are two other rooms. So if you head back to WebEx and by clicking on the schedule, if you enter one of those rooms, the web the um, Zoom link will be in that room to head to that session. So thank you all so much for a great opening to a wonderful workshop. I'm so excited to have all of you here and thank you to our keynotes and our workshop committee for your time and contributions this morning. And we'll see you back in about five minutes for our first session. Thanks, Amazing. everyone. 
And don't forget to enter keynote underscore Wendy oh, yes. into the shuffleboard contest. And you guys will get 50 points for attending today's session. Yes, I pasted that in the chat as well. Yay. Thanks, everyone. All right. Happy Top Kit. <laughs>